Ladies and gentlemen, we will start with presentations by our distinguished speakers. I would like to introduce the first speaker for this morning, the Department Rajalingam of Nanyang Technological University, NTU Singapore. Dr. Primon is currently the head of Teaching, Learning and Pedagogy Division, TLDP, in NTU. He received his PhD in Education Psychology from Monash University, Australia. Prior to his appointment as the head of Teaching, Learning and Pedagogy Division, he was the Assistant Dean Educational Development at LKC Maxson in NTU. As Assistant Dean, he was responsible for faculty development, digital learning, consulting on curriculum development, and scholarship in medical education. The department was instrumental in setting up and scaling up the use of team-based learning, TBL, at the medical school. So this morning, the department is going to share with us about the value of SOTA while setting up a new medical college. So that the department, over to you, please. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Chen. Uh, and firstly, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dato. Professor Muhammad uh, Kadim for that uh, wonderful presentation to help me understand a little bit more about what CALM does as well. Um, let me share my slides and uh, I will start my presentation. Okay, so I just want to make sure that everyone can see my slides. So. Um, to follow up from Prof Chen's introduction, um, I'm, I actually have a very similar role over at NTU to uh, Prof Chen. We have a small unit called the Teaching Learning Pedagogy Division, which does many of the same things that CAM does in terms of uh, trying to inculcate a culture of scho the scholarship of teaching and learning throughout the university. And um, when you spoke about your grants, which support uh, scholarship of teaching and learning, we have something very similar in place. And perhaps this is something else we can talk about at another time. But today, I'm actually not going to spend too much time talking about what we do at university level, because I think other speakers will speak about this. What I really wanted to speak about is uh, my own experience, right? Uh, before I started this role uh, in the teaching and learning pedagogy division with the medical school and setting up a new medical college. Uh, I think it's an interesting experience because and a rare one, because it's very rare that you have the opportunity to set up a school from scratch. Uh, we joined or we started uh, this process about eight years ago. And in this process, there were many things that we had to think about. And throughout this process, there were many questions, uncertain things um, that we had to, to figure out uh, either by the evidence which is out there or by uh, doing a little bit of our own scholarly inquiry into the topic. So what I'm going to talk about a lot today is that journey right, uh, in a few areas and use that as an exemplar to think about how you can weave um, the scholarship of teaching and learning uh, into your curriculum development and setting up a new program and maybe convince everyone of its real value uh, in setting up a new program, but also in uncertain times like this, when we're teaching and learning in very uh, new and perhaps uh, untested ways. So I'm going to uh, go a little bit more. So um, yeah, uh, let me skip past this. I'm gonna, sh throughout this presentation, I'll be using a tool to get feedback from the audience. Uh, that tool is Mentimeter. I'll bring it up on the slides in a few minutes. Uh, and you can either um, use another device and uh, go to the Mentimeter, or you can uh, use your computer. If you're using a computer, enter the code there. But before we do that, I'm going to show you a video. Unfortunately, this video doesn't have any sound, but I want everyone to pay very close attention to the video and ask yourself, what are the students doing in this video?
Okay. Um, and I want you to think about this. What were students doing in that video? You didn't hear the sound, but if you heard the sound, you'd hear a very noisy classroom, everyone talking at the same time. Okay. If you have an answer in your head, let's try the first Mentimeter quiz. All right. So if you go to this website, www.menti.com, and enter the code above, 83, 51, 76, and 2, right? You will see this question on your screen and you can answer that question. I'll give everyone a minute to get to this site. Okay, we have one answer in already. Okay, I think it's okay. So it's interesting, right? So most people here think they're discussing our lecture. A uh, small number said she was doing a test, one said studying for the final exam, and two said having fun. What if I told you that all of these answers were somewhat acceptable, right? They're all somewhat true. Uh, if you looked at the video, they were definitely having fun, right? If you looked carefully around the room, you'd see there were timers on the screens. So there was a countdown. They were doing something under time pressure, right? Uh, there, I do also agree they were discussing a lecture and they in, in this, doing all of this, they were studying for the final exam. If I had to choose the best answer, I would choose doing a test. But don't worry if you didn't choose the best answer because I haven't told you quite what was going on in that video. I just wanted to introduce that video uh, because I think the point I wanted to make about the opportunities of doing things differently or starting a new school or being uh, disrupted by uh, the current pandemic is that you have you have opportunity to change the way you teach and learn right but you also have an opportunity to study uh, and inform others about whether these approaches then work better uh, than previous approaches so my best answer would be doing a test right and i'll explain why later uh, and i'll come back to that in a short while okay let me just go back to my other slides and before i go on with the rest of my presentation right I, I thought for those of you who haven't looked at uh, this wonderful book by John Hattie, I would really recommend it, right? Um, John Hattie has essentially done a meta-analysis of meta-analysis, right? Uh, and he has looked at all the evidence uh, in various areas about the various educational interventions which work, right? For example, that, that discussion we had in the class. And he's come up with various conclusions, and I won't go through all his conclusions, but I, I'm introducing this book because it's a good read, and he has a really nice uh, quote in the book, which I think um, for me really sums up the value of uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning. And it's this. After looking at all the evidence, he says, a remarkable feature of the evidence that is, is that the greatest effect on students' learning occur when teachers become learners of their own teaching, and I think this really reflects the importance of the scholarship of teaching and learning and when students become their own teachers. Uh, and I think this speaks to some other thing about how students, you know, students now need to take more ownership of their own learning and be uh, student centered. But I just want to uh, start with that quote before I go on to talk a little bit more about the medical school, what the, what the innovations were, how we did um, um, some research and scholarship in that and how it helped us inform the program. Okay, so a bit of background. Uh, as you know, Singapore is a small place. Um, we are densely populated, and for the longest time, we only had one medical school. Uh, our colleagues at NUS have, have had this medical school in place for uh, over well over 100 years, and most of Singapore doctors were trained in this medical school. Um, a few years ago, I think now about uh, 15 years, actually, 10 to 15 years ago, there was a graduate medical college, which was a collaboration between Duke University and NUS, which takes in graduate students, very much focused on clinician scientists. And the Lee Kong Chin School of Medicine, right, which is a joint uh, school of uh, NTU and Imperial College, uh, was set up in, uh, we took our first batch of students in, in 2013. And uh, as you can see, the largest school is still the NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine with over 300 students. Uh, Duke NUS is about 50 students, and we are at about 165 students right now. So as I mentioned, it's a joint medical school. It's a five-year MBBS program. Um, the interesting thing about this school is the decision was made not just to take an established program from Imperial College and bring it over, 
but faculty from both sides got to got together to do something different. So for example, the session you saw earlier, which was team-based learning, is not something that Imperial uh, had been doing when we started. But when we decided to build a new curriculum together, we decided to do things differently and introduced it uh, at the Lee Kong Chen School of Medicine. And this is an impact both uh, in the medical school, in the larger university, and interestingly, back at Imperial College as well. Okay. And when you start a new program, you can do a few things uh, quite differently. So I'm going to go through these things quite differently before I, I, I jump into the real scholarship that we did. One of the things we decided to do differently from a normal program, I'm showing you here on this slide uh, what the year one and year two curriculum looks like. Right? So for those of you all who have had a health background, a science background, a medical background, you may be wondering, these are the blocks that are taught in year one. We have an introduction to medical science, a cardiorespiratory, renal endocrine, musculoskeletal and skin, and similarly in year two, where are the topics like anatomy and biochemistry, which are foundational topics in, 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 uh, in medical schools? Well, they are there, but one of the innovations we decided to do is not have them uploaded upfront, rather they're embedded within these blocks. To give you an example, anatomy is really important, but it's important throughout medical school. So when they're doing the cardiorespiratory block, they will be learning the anatomy of the heart and the anatomy of the lungs, right? uh, the anatomy of the uh, circulation system. Similarly, they'll learn the bi right biochemistry and the right physiology uh, at the time when that uh, systems box are presented to them. Okay, that was one of the innovations we put in place. A second thing when you start a new school is that you can use a lot of technology. right? So we could play around with all kinds of tools, some which worked, some which didn't work so well. Uh, so our students had digital portfolios to record all their clinical experiences. We experimented quite a bit with uh, augmented and virtual reality uh, using virtual dissection as well. And rather than use uh, real cadavers, which are hard to come by and expensive, um, and not always, um, given the current uh, scholarship in the area, the best way for all students to learn, they used real human bodies which were plastinated, right? Together with virtual dissection and using real patients and imaging modalities like ultrasound to teach what human anatomy looks like. Okay. Another innovation was way before students entered the clinical experience, we wanted them to be well prepared for their clinical experience. So right from year one in the classroom, we brought uh, patients in, but not real patients, simulated patients in to teach clinical communication. We had nurses, this is our, my colleague Romani, a nurse teaching uh, for, uh, future medical students about how to do things like draw blood, right? And finally learn clinical methods using the same simulated patient. When I say simulated patient, this is not a real patient, he's an actor hired to play the role. So they can practice all of this before they actually see real patients. So these are some of the innovations we talked about, but really, uh, I want to focus this presentation on uh, perhaps what uh, I was most involved in in the initial stages and what uh, 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 I think affects a lot of students in the first, second and third year. We decided to do away with any large group lecture. So we essentially have a lecture free medical curriculum. All the large group lectures are, de uh, uh, are delivered using this approach called team based learning. And the video which I showed you in the beginning and you voted for, that was students doing a certain component of team-based learning, uh, which I will walk you through right now, what that looks like. So this is the entire process of team-based learning. I said it's lecture free. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't give students information. We record the lectures or video record the lectures um, in the form of half an hour or 40 minute snippets. These lectures are then given to the students and they have about four to six hours to individually watch the lectures on their own at home right, before they come to class. This is of course supported by our learning management system. The first thing they do when they come to class is they do an individual readiness test. This just means it's an individual MCQ test which con consists of about 20 to 30 MCQ questions. So when they come into class, it's very quiet. Everyone sits down and does the test. What they immediately do after they do the test 
they now turn to the, the team member sitting in the team and they do the same test. Because when they did the test individually, we didn't tell them whether they got it right or wrong. But when they did it as a team, we have a system to give them immediate feedback. And if you looked at what, if you think back to the video in the beginning, with the students all talking to each other in that very messy room and no one could find out where the, the, the teachers were, they were actually doing this team test. Right? And this is why I said, for me, the most immediate thing they were doing was the team test. But also, they seem to be having fun because they like discussing their answers. They like getting immediate feedback from each other. Um, but at, at the same time, right, we also hope that by doing this, they're really getting deeply, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, they're questioning the, the things they read deeply and in some way preparing themselves for real life and the exam. Finally, they get a chance to ask questions to the instructor and other students. And often what happens is the instructor doesn't answer all the questions. There's someone in the in the larger class who has already figured out the answer. And we facilitate the discussion so that that person can then answer their teammates. Right? All of this portion is to make sure that they understand the concepts well. But what is concepts without having a deep understanding of how to apply these concepts? And in the second phase of team-based learning, again, it's two team activities. First, we get them to sit down in their groups of uh, five or six and have them work on clinical problems or cases. Then each group simultaneously reports their answer, either using technology or holding up the answer, and we have a whole, wide, a whole classroom wide discussion. So team-based learning is not new. We didn't introduce it at uh, the Lee Kong Chen School of Medicine. It actually has been around in business for quite some time. Um, perhaps in the last 15 years, it's been uh, adopted in uh, various uh, medical colleges uh, around the world, uh, starting mostly in North America. I think one of the things that we did when we started a new school, I think we won the first few schools at an undergraduate level to decide to completely do team-based learning, to do away with lectures altogether. The other thing we decided to do, which um, was perhaps unusual, was to do it on a very, very large scale. So we had very large classes rather than small classes. So um, the classroom you see behind me, the virtual classroom, is where we have team-based learning. Uh, currently, this has, uh, like I mentioned, over 160 students, but this is capable of holding over 200 students. So there were many questions around, could you completely do away with lectures? Could you replace, um, uh, 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 um, you know, could you have large group uh, team-based learning uh, and could it still be effective? Okay, so one of the first things that uh, we did was based on our own reflection and experience on this, we started to write up some of these findings. And this is where I think, um, uh, it, it was an interesting experience for us because even though my background was in uh, educational psychology, many of my colleagues were not from an educational background. So, but they were together with me as they, as we experimented and we built uh, uh, this uh, uh, team-based learning approach together. So one of the first things we had to ask ourselves was, what, is a, what were the critical success factors for large-scale TBL? So I'm going to, before I answer this question and share with you what we reported, I'm going to ask everyone to go back to the Mentimeter and maybe you can share with us what you think were the critical factors. So if you go back to your Mentimeter screen right now, this time you have an open-ended question and you can put in uh, what you think in one word, two words or three words, what do you think uh, is a critical success factor for large-scale TPL? Very interesting. Communication seems to be uh, very strong, and I, I tend to agree, especially communication between the faculty members, right, and with the faculty members and students. Interesting that you have room set up there. I, I tend to agree, and I'll touch on some of these here in a minute. A shared mental model, faculty development, yeah. Learning spaces, inspiration, timing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
these are all very, very good points. And, and actually, they resonate very much with what we think as well. Okay. Maybe a few more minutes for the last few people to put in their answers. Yep, the discussion, the model, the competency, the design, the communication, of course. Okay, yeah. All of these are very true. Let me go back to my slides and tell you what we brought it down to uh, and what uh, we felt were uh, really important factors. So one, as you mentioned, was this, the design of the learning space, the space that you see behind me. We did realize, as you, as you noticed, the first video was in a much smaller space, and obviously we had to grow. One of the things that, uh, that we quickly realized and we, had, we wanted to share in a scholarly way with the rest of the community was that you can do team-based learning in any space, but if you're doing it on a very large scale, things like the spaces, the learning spaces become very important. If you do 200 students in a lecture theater, it becomes actually very much less uh, engaging uh, for students and very difficult to have a, a discussion with teams in a meaningful way. Right? So the spaces become more important as the size grows. The other thing which we, we talked about, and I didn't see this mentioned uh, earlier, and we found this really, really important, and actually even more important now that uh, we've had to move many of the team-based learning online, uh, and I'll talk about that later, is we invested quite a bit in developing uh, a digital learning ecosystem, a system where we can send the questions to the students, send the reading material to the students, get feedback, um, give feedback to the students and get feedback about how the whole class is performing. And the last thing, which I call team teaching, uh, really is this idea of the shared mental models and faculty development. And I'll tell you what these three things are a little bit, uh, and and uh, and we'll do and and why we think that. Uh, so, why this is important is we didn't sit down beforehand and say these were the three things that were important. As we developed the program, I must admit, we, we made mistakes and we stumbled through a lot of things, as you often do when you set up something new, as we all are doing now, as we transition towards uh, online learning. And I think it's really, really important at some point to sit down with the people you did this with and be reflective and look back and see what were the real success factors. Right? And so let me share, let me go through these three things which I talked about. The first thing I said was, of course, this team-centric learning space. I think it's really important to have uh, uh, spaces where the students feel comfortable, right? The one very particular design that we wanted, we didn't want a very clear logical front, right? Even though the instructor tends to sit right in front, the students, as you can see, face in all kinds of directions. Uh, what is more important than what we thought, and we will confirm this later with some of our scholarship, than facing the front, we felt that the students, it's more important for students to be able to sit in a small group and discuss. And as long as the instructor had an overview and could walk around, that was uh, our main design consideration. The other thing which we felt, oops, okay, so uh, let me, let me before I move on, share, I'll go back to my Mentimeter, I forgot I had this here. Okay, so if you were a student in this class, right? So this we we designed it, we built it. Where do you think is the best place to sit in this particular classroom? Okay, and I'm going to go back to my Mentimeter and ask you to answer this question now. Is the best place to sit in the classroom in the front near the presenter? At the back? Close to either side? Anywhere? but with your front facing the presenter. Mm, very interesting. So before I show you the results for this, just to expand how, why uh, the, the scholarship of teaching and learning is important. This was not a question which initially concerned the faculty. We went ahead, we built these, these rooms, spent a lot of money for it, and then one of the students came to us and said, I feel that my team is being disadvantaged because you know, uh, we are always in, in a position quite far away from the instructor and we feel that we're there the whole year, we are being disadvantaged. So actually I said, that's a really interesting thing. We never measured it before. Let's do a bit of an experiment. Um, we will swap the team from the back to the front and we'll see whether this is true or not. 
and uh, I'll show you what and, and what we did is we also looked at those with their backs facing and their front facing. And let me show you uh, these results. And this is actually quite recent. So, so this is a very busy slide, right? And uh, the student is trying to get it uh, published right now. This is a year five medical student, right? And he's, uh, I think, almost ready to publish this up, right? So what he found was very interesting. He did the study both in the year one and the year two, right? So what you see with this line is uh, group uh, uh, B, right, moved from uh, near to far, Yes, near to far, near to far, and group A moved from far to near. So they took the, the, the groups at the back and they swapped them to the front and they did a bit of an experiment. And what he measured uh, was engagement, right? Asking the students how engaged they were both after the whole session and by interrupting them during the session whenever the discussion was going on. And he found something quite interesting. Uh, this column was the novice group. That means these were students who are very new to TBL. And he did the same experiment with students who have had one year experience with TBL. For one thing, the changes are not very big, they're very slight, which is quite heartening for us. It means that, you know, even if whether you sit with your back closer to the back or closer to the, to the instructor, it doesn't make a big difference. But all the differences he saw were with the new students, right? Those who were new to TBL. Those who were more experienced for some reason, right, seem to be more resilient to this. We don't know why, but I think this is really interesting little bit of evidence which will help us think about, do we now need to move the groups around more during the course of the year, right? Also, what happens in after one year of experience with TBL? Does that mean that students become more resilient? Maybe they become less dependent on the tutor explanation. These are things we don't know, but hopefully, uh, you know, He's interested in this now, and we can take this further. On the topic which you all chose, does it matter whether your back or your front faces the instructor? Interestingly, when we measured engagement, it didn't seem to affect whether their back or their front faced the, faced the instructor, but students by far preferred to sit with their front facing the instructor. And that may be just the, you know, the, the, the psychology of not wanting to turn your back to the teacher. But so the good news is these round tables work. They don't always have to face you. There may be some preference for sitting in front, especially with year, newer, newer, younger students. But this seems to not uh, hold out very much when you do the method over a long period of time. And this was quite heartening to us because we had spent a lot of money on the rooms. And it's good to see that at least, you know, they seem to work for most students, no matter where they sit. But this has also informed our practice because then Half, uh, half a, a year in, we can move the groups around so everyone sits in a slightly different place. Okay. Another thing I want to uh, talk about, which was uh, something we introduced, was we spent a lot of money on a digital learning ecosystem. So all our students, remember when they were doing the quiz, actually on their screens, they were answering questions like this, right? Individually, and then as a team, right? what they would do is they would choose the different answers. So let's say these members, uh, these are the students in the team, right? They all said how certain they were, or, you know, uh, these two seemed 30% certain and 50% certain on what was the right choice. They clicked on it, but it was wrong. So the team then has to have a discussion and perhaps they would go with what uh, this other gentleman said, and then they pick another answer. And that uh, then uh, gives them some immediate feedback but they may not be satisfied with that answer, so they can ask a question. So we really wanted to um, develop this completely digital, digitally, even though it's possible to do this with our handouts and cards, et cetera, because we were doing it on a large scale. And this allowed us certain affordances because it allowed us to look at almost a, a snapshot view of what the whole class was doing at one time. So at an individual level, we could see quickly how um, how the whole class was doing, right? This also uh, translated to how they were doing as a team. And we had a snapshot of what questions they were going to ask. And so while the students were busy in that discussion, having this noise, actually right in the corner, you weren't able to see them or the faculty members looking at some of this data. Right? And what we would be doing is, oh, they all seem to be getting a question, question two wrong. Why are they getting question two wrong? Why do they think the answer is D? Right? What do you think? They are? 
I think we, we, we better, you know, uh, spend some time thinking about how we're going to explain this to the students, or maybe there was a mistake in the pre reading. And so this, this becomes very interesting discussions among the faculty. The last thing I think that we thought were, was important was this. Uh, a, a number of you mentioned uh, how do you one of the critical success factors here was faculty development, a, sh a shared mental model. Uh, one of the things we realized very early on in a medical school, not many of the teachers are full time teachers. Many of them are practicing clinicians. Uh, some are scientists. So what we figured was. We didn't want any one person to teach on their own. Actually, initially, we did this as a form of faculty development. Someone from um, the teaching learning division within the medical school would then be in a session to help your subject matter experts, your scientists and your clinicians to uh, run the session. They would be responsible for the content, but the facilitator would be responsible for facilitating the students, for making sure that the answers were not given away too quickly, that the teams were engaged in productive discussion. Uh, the clinicians always w talked about the application of the knowledge, but the scientists were really good at talking about the basic principles. So as we evolved, we realized that the best teaching uh, in this setting to have that shared mental model was when we were able to bring in these different perspectives and give each each individual a slightly uh, 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 different aspect of which part of the teaching process that they were responsible for. Right? And I must say we did now when we write this up, it does seem like, oh, we planned it all in the beginning, but it wasn't the case. We evolved this approach through trial and error. And again, the value of, of, of scholarship in these areas is once you've found something that works, right, and you have evidence that it works and you've articulated the principles, this is where you need to share it. Share it with um, uh, the, uh, the rest of the community, in this case, the rest of the community using team-based learning and perhaps other uh, people using similar methods, but also then that gives credibility to what you are doing within the school itself. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to go through a few other examples. I mean, I know I have a lot of examples here, but I really want to use this as an opportunity um, to inspire people that, you know, the, the, the ideas around um, uh, scholarship and teaching and learning are just all around you, right? Um, so one of the other questions we asked ourselves was, okay, now we know that um, team-based learning works, right? So why does it work? What were some of the psychological or educational processes which underpin team-based learning? So this is a harder question, but I'm going to bring you back to the Mentimeter again, and let's brainstorm that now. All right? Let's uh, let's tell me what you think. What is one educational or psychological process which underpins team-based learning, which makes it work? Scaffolding. That's a good one. So. We 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 had this as well, and and uh, we were we uh, we were lucky enough to have a, a visiting professor who is uh, very experienced in educational psychology. But what we sat down with was also a lot of our faculty members who had no background in 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 uh, uh, educational psychology or educational theory. And essentially, what we did was was many of of them had experience with the method. So they sat down and we said, let's try to. Let's try to, from our own understanding, brainstorm and come up with a theoretical framework for why uh, this particular team-based learning approach would work, right? And uh, let me just bring this back, sorry. Okay. And one of the things we said, these were the different parts of team-based learning, and many of the people who, who, who did this work did a similar process to what I helped you engage in as well. We brainstormed, we, we, we looked at what we thought worked in the process. And then after we looked at the literature and we wrote up something, right? So like many of you said, uh, an important part is the preparation, right? We call it self-guided preparation or knowledge consolidation. And then someone said iteration, right? So yes, it is it's the iteration of once they come into class, they have to try to retrieve from their knowledge what they what they had, right? And finally, uh, they had to sit down, or not finally, but next they had to sit down and elaborate their knowledge with their peers, right? And then give each other uh, feedback 
in the class discussion and get some feedback from the instructor. And finally, do some transfer of knowledge. And one of the things someone said in our discussion was, that's all good, but you know, what if they do the preparation just the day itself? We said, no, that's not, that's not very good. So one of the things we included when we said we will come up with a framework for how we think this works, we think sleep is very important. So they have to sleep after they do their self-reading and they come in and do all of this. Again, you know, uh, uh, we wouldn't have done this if we didn't have these discussions with the team, right? And say that we had something meaningful to share with the, uh, the literature. Okay, so again, sorry for all the Mentimeter going up and down, but I find this is, I like to interact with the audience and this is my way of uh, having some interaction with all of you. So we, we, this is what the instructors think is important. What do you think the students think is the most important thing? So we think sleep is important. We think, um, uh, um, yeah, that the iteration is important. We think that uh, peer elaboration is important. I've gone, brought you through the TBL process. What do you think students think is the most important thing? Okay, that's really interesting. So. Um, I'm going to take back the slides again, uh, bring back my slides again. And um, so what we did, right, this is the team-based learning process. And we said, oh, you know, we think this is important, but we always ask students questions about what they think the team-based learning process is. So we had a course survey question, each of them, you know, having, looking at different parts of it. And we said, let's ask the students what they think is the most important. And we asked, we built this very, very complicated model. So I'm not gonna go through this model in detail, but one of the things is, um, and, we, and we did a lot of things, but one of the things we found was really, really important, right? With all the data that we looked at, because we had people in the medical school who were very data driven, was that from the student perspective and by multiple studies that we looked at, by far the most important thing to students was the small group discussion, right? So. The small group discussion, which happens uh, when, just like that video I showed you up front, right? After they do the, the individual test, they're discussing it in their team, and when they're discussing the application exercise in their team as well. And for some reason, that discussion, right, in the team really predicts uh, how engaged they are throughout the whole session, right? Uh, if we go back to this very complicated model, which I don't spend too much time on because I think there are too many connections here, the, it's very clear that the team discussions are actually also very central. So one of the questions that we started to ask is, we think this is important, but what do the student think is important? And from various studies, we do kind of realize that the team uh, is the most important aspect. Okay, I'm going to uh, rush a little bit further now because I'm going to save uh, sometime. I'm going to ask one last question and maybe I'll skip to the end and we can have more discussions about um, how to create this kind of culture of scholarship and teaching and learning within the school. So the last question is this, should students be graded for the individual test in TPL? And this is a simple uh, yes, no question. Uh, and uh, we'll tell you what we found. See, we should have listened to all of you. I'll tell you all a story and why this question was really important. And sometimes when you design a curriculum, you make certain changes. Um, we started by grading the students uh, and, and we started by giving them a very small grade, uh, about 15% um, for all of the TBL sessions they do. And they do about, um, if I'm not wrong, uh, 60 to 70 sessions a year, right? full day sessions. And, and, and that, and that grade was divided from the individual test, the team test, and the application exercise. So some of the grade came from the team, some of the grade came from the individual. After about one and a half years of doing this, we said, no, we, we don't think that's a good idea. The students are very stressed. We didn't want to create a hyper-competitive environment. And the students themselves, oh yeah, that's very good. And one day we decided to go back and look at uh, how, whether it made a difference to grade or not, right? And one of the things we looked at was this, this was, uh, if you look at everything above this red line, this was the points where we graded, I mean, it's 5%, just 5% of the grade uh, would count towards a GPA, and there would be a separate exam still. And everything below this line, and this was one cohort which did half, uh, half uh, ungraded, 
half graded and then half ungraded was uh, ungraded, so it was purely formative. Good news and bad news is ungrading it, the students still took it seriously, and that may be because they were medical students, very selected, but even with medical students and a very small grade, right, what we found uh, was there was a significant difference in both their, of course, the performance in the IRATs, but also surprisingly for us, a different difference in the performance in the exams, right? Uh, correcting for, you know, uh, their background and other things. Right. So, um, okay, I, I, I think I'm almost out of time and I don't want to spend too much time more. So I'm going to skip past a, a few things and go back to the uh, a last slide again and, and give uh, John Hattie, I guess, kind of uh, one of the final words um, and maybe just one more framework to introduce. So again, I, I think that why do we do SOTL, right? We do SOTL uh, not just uh, so that we can get published and for our own careers. We do SOTL because I think, I genuinely believe that if you engage the people who are teaching or setting up a new program in SOTL, you get a much, much stronger, better program out of it. It informs all your decisions as you design the program. Um, and you don't have to be an educational psychologist or educational lit, uh, researcher to engage in this kind of work. Actually, a lot of the work that we engaged in, as I mentioned, uh, came from interest of people who are involved in the program. Um, many of them scientists, some of them doctors, and sometimes even students who came up with questions that they wanted to ask. And in each case, I think what we found and what we reported had impact in the school, uh, it had impact in the university and sometimes beyond. Uh, and it, it also helped us tweak our practice right? and give us confidence that what we were doing was the right thing. Um, I won't go through this, in, but another wonderful framework to think about all of this complexity when you're engaging uh, in SOTL is uh, uh, this by uh, Linda Price and Adrian Kirkwood. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, again, I don't think I have enough time, but I will share these slides for you and you can look up this uh, when the time permits. So uh, thank you very much. All right. Um, and apologies for rushing the presentation a little bit at the end. Right? But yeah, so this is our first batch of students, which you saw, who have now graduated about, well, almost three years ago. Right? Uh, and they're all practicing uh, medicine in Singapore right now. So uh, with that, uh, thank you everyone for your attention. And I will end my presentation. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Kremen uh, for the interactive presentation and also very uh, insightful sharing on how SOTER benefited the setting up of uh, TBL, Team Best Learning in a Medical Collection. Yeah. And that as, yeah, as you know that uh, in Unimas, we also have a medical faculty. So I think this is really very helpful. And it is interesting to also know how to implement a TBL on a large scale and how sort of inquiries uh, provide insights yeah, into its implementations. Like, for instance, you talk about the connective engagement, you know, your study on the effects of the grading and the effects of the different, uh, different uh, sites of the uh, learning space and so on and so forth. That is very, very insightful. Okay, so the question is about uh, how to make sure that students really share their knowledge with others in TBL. And I think this question is very much related to another question, which is about what was done to enhance the shared mental model among the parties involved. Yeah? So based on the question, it says that in most cases, Students tend to focus more on uh, getting good grades yeah, and thus may not share the same ideas about what the facilitator or instructor values about TBL. So uh, uh, can Dr. Prema give a little bit of feedback on this? So I will. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't want to turn this into a TBL presentation, but I'll use it as a way to... These are questions that we asked ourselves as well. And when we asked ourselves these questions, so uh, one one of the ways we answered this question was, for example, the first question: 
what can you do to incentivize students to participate in the collaborative discussions more meaningfully rather than be selfish? So this was a question that we looked at the literature, what scholarship other people had done, and the recommendation, uh, both empirical and from a principal perspective, was if you grade components of DBL, you have to grade both the individual and the team components. And the idea was you are communicating to students that uh, the collaborative components are just as important as the individual com components. And that's what we did. And then we followed that up by actually monitoring based on the data that we had. And then we didn't publish this, but we shared it internally. Right? So I think that's one of the ways to do that. The second question on uh, how do you build a shared mental models? This, I think, is something we really struggled with. You know, you, do, you, you it, when you start something new, we start a new program, that's the best time to build shared mental models, right? And this is an area where um, we knew that, uh, you know, as academic de developers, many of us are here, sometimes faculty are the most resistant to doing something new, right? But when we had our approach, we said we won't have a single faculty member responsible for a single session, rather we'd have uh, a clinician paired with a scientist, paired with initially what were the academic developers to help them cope with facilitating, etc. Over a period of time, we found that this was a kind of secret faculty development. The fact that you were in the class and you were working with faculty, hey, you know, this question, you don't want to give the answer away straight away. You know, you really want them to discuss it and make mistakes and discuss with each other. And the more you engage in this kind of conversations, the more people came to an agreement of what this shared mental model was. Right? And I think this was something that we uh, we discovered um, through our own experience because we were trying to be pragmatic about making it work. And this is something now that we have written up as well. Right? Again, feeding back into the idea of uh, how, how um, at least from my experience, uh, what has worked in terms of scholarship teaching and learning is always to start with these questions that people are asking, right? And then uh, experiment, look at literature, reflect, uh, and maybe then uh, do uh, collect more data and write it up. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. I think there is also another very interesting question uh, that was uh, raised by another participant, uh, which talks about in TBL, the focus is more on the students' learning ability and initiative. Then does the teacher scholarship matter so much? Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Freeman, you have to answer this. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to look for that question again. Yeah, he was asking whether the teacher's uh, scholarship actually matter when actually in TBL, the focus is more on the students' learning and uh, the learning ability and their initiative. So oh, where the teacher's scholarship comes in. <laughs> I think it does matter because, you know, look, yeah. uh, even though TBL is used in a different place and many ways and context matters, as, as I think Johan has said earlier. So. When you're using TBL, and I think there's another question which I answered online about how about Asian students. So the reason for scholarship and why teachers need to engage in scholarship, even like in an approach with TBL, is to understand deeply the context, right? And then tweak their instructional uh, teaching, their teaching and learning practices so it works for the students. Um, so I'm sure medical students will respond quite differently from non from social science students. Um, Asian students may 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 respond differently or not from other students. And if we don't engage in scholarship, right, then we are not really being reflective about our own teaching practice and we're not making the most of it. True, and that's why uh, we have SOTA and that's why SOTA is so important, you know, to, to get into knowing the differences uh, uh, in different contexts. Yeah? Uh, that's why uh, I think uh, Dr. Praman has answered very well and how uh, uh, our professor here will be really getting into a sort of after this. Yeah? 